Well, I did not have the opportunity to introduce myself earlier. My name is Josh Burnham, lead pastor here at Bethel. And um, what you're experiencing today is what we call our celebration service. We feel like the people of, that the people of God should have more joy than any other people in the world. And for me, you know, if you can't celebrate someone coming to faith in Jesus Christ through baptism, if you can't celebrate communion and the Lord's Supper, you don't know Jesus or you don't know the one I do. Because when Jesus changes your life, he gives you the greatest joy the world has ever known. And so what we do today, you might find us a little peculiar today because we're more joyful than we have ever been because of what Jesus has done for us. Uh, with that, we're going to pick up again in a sermon we, sermon series we started three weeks ago now. Um, and it's in the book of Numbers called Lost. I had an email this week. Um, it was actually a daughter who emailed me on behalf of her mom. Um, but this lady said, my mom is 82 years old. And she has been a Christ follower since she was 11. I'll let you do the math. I don't know what that is. And she has never once heard a pastor preach in the book of Numbers. And she said, we are eagerly waiting and listening. Um, they're probably listening right now. And I said, this is incredible. So yes, we are in the book of Numbers. You did not miss hear what I said. Some of the engineers in the, the gathering are like, finally, nail this. So the book of Numbers is in the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus and now Numbers. And in the last three years, we as a church have actually walked through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. And now we see Numbers chapter six. And the reason we've called this message, this sermon series, Lost, because we see the people of God wandering. Really, the Hebrew is but mid bars in the wilderness. It's not something you count in numbers wise, it's in the wilderness. People are lost, God's people are lost. And what do you do when you're lost? You need hope. And the hope we have is in Jesus Christ. And we see that again here in Numbers chapter 6. Let me begin, let me begin with a story. Um, Jesse Jackson, the famed activist, current activist also, went to a university in Mississippi one day. Actually, it was the University of Southern Miss. And he, he was on tour with the president and he walked and he, as he was in the, I guess they would call it the quad or the the big grassy area that every university has at some point in the university context. Um, he, he walked upon what he thought was a couple and it, they were a very unusual couple because the man was 6'8 and the young woman was three foot three, give or take. And he watched and this big tall man reached up, picked this little woman up gave her a kiss on her forehead and sent her off to class. And he looked at the president and said, what just happened? And this is what the president explained. He said, what you don't realize, Mr. Jackson, is that this is a star basketball player in the, in the University of Southern Miss. And the young woman that he was walking with was his sister. And what you don't understand at this point yet, Mr. Jackson, is that both of their parents died when they were youth. And the star basketball player made a vow to his parents that he would take care of his sister. And he said he had scholarship offers throughout the whole nation. But this was the only university that would give his sister a scholarship. And so he came to this university because he made a vow to his parents that he was willing to keep. And this is a story that stuck with Mr. Jackson. And so he, he went up to the athlete and said, well, um, Sir, what's your name? My name is Mr. Jackson. What's your name? And he said, why are you doing this? And the athlete simply shrugged and said, those of us who God makes six, eight have to look out for those that God makes three foot three. This man took a vow that he was willing to keep for the rest of his life. Now, why do I relay that message because we live in a world just, and I know I'm a young person. And so some of you who are not as young are gonna say, yes, absolutely, amen. You know, we live in a world where our commitments and our sense of dedication is no longer what it used to be. And it's not necessarily an age specific struggle. It's a cultural struggle. 
And so how do we now as people of God dedicate ourselves to the things and the purposes of Christ as we need them to be? And so I just simply ask before we read the word of God, are you willing to make a promise to God that you're willing to keep? And be honest with yourself, right? If you're not willing to follow Christ with your full heart, your full soul, your full mind, don't act like you are. And I'm saying that to me too. I've been praying and looking at myself in the mirror this week and asking myself, Josh, are you willing to dedicate yourself to the Lord like you said you did? Because when you confess Christ as Lord, that was a dedication. That was a vow. And are you taking that vow seriously? It's a hard question to answer, isn't it? Let's look at one of the vows in the Old Testament. Um, Genesis, Genesis, Numbers chapter six, beginning in verse one. Numbers six, verse one. Lord, may we keep our promises. The Lord instructed Moses, saying in verse two, speak to the Israelites and tell them, when a man or a woman makes a special vow, a Nazarite vow, to consecrate himself to the Lord, he is to abstain from wine and beer. He must not drink vinegar made from wine or from beer. He must not drink any grape juice. And yes, I see the irony that we're taking communion today. Or eat fresh grapes or raisins. He is not to eat anything produced by the grapevine from the seeds to the skin during the period of his consecration. Verse five. You must not cut his hair throughout the time of his vow of consecration. He may be holy until the time is completed during which he consecrates himself to the Lord. He is to let his hair of his head grow long. He must not go near a dead body during the time he consecrates himself to the Lord. He is not to defile himself for his father or mother or brother or sister when they die, while the mark of consecration to his God is on his head. He is to be holy to the Lord during the time of consecration. Let's pray. Father, um, oftentimes as we read your word, um, Lord, it seems so ancient and so far from anything we experience today. But Lord, we know that's not the case. We know that your word is living and it is active that all scripture is God-breathed and it is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting and training in righteousness. So Father, right now we ask that you through your Holy Spirit would open our minds, you would open our hearts, you would train us in righteousness, that we would not be hearers to be entertained, but that we would live out the holy mission that you have called us to live in Christ Jesus, we pray, amen. So I have two points today, uh, not two short points, but two points. Uh, the first is say what? And the second is now what? Okay, so what is, what is this Nazarite vow? So what you've seen, if you've been reading through numbers and I encourage you to do so, we have booklets that we put together um, on the members table um, as you leave, that's for free for anyone. Just kind of walk through the book of numbers and it gives you some history. But we look at this and so far in the book of Numbers, we've seen God count his people as if to say, you're mine and you're mine and you're mine and you're mine and I know your name and I know your number. And then God gives the priest specific ways that they can honor him. But what happens if you're not a priest? What happens if you're not born of the tribe of Levi and you can never fulfill what you maybe want to do in the temple to the Lord as an act of worship? Or what if you're female? And you never have the ability to honor God like you want to honor him with a special dedication. Well, number six is exactly for you. That's why the vow is here. That any person can, can dedicate themselves for a specific time to the Lord. Now, what does this include? So the Nazarite, Nazir, Nazarite literally means to separate. So the person who would take this vow would separate themselves for the purposes of God. We'll come back to that. Why is that important? Because the Lord desires that we separate. The word special vow means to do a difficult thing. So this person is separating themselves to do a difficult thing for who? For God. And if you dedicate yourselves to the Lord for his purpose, it changes your life. It changes the way you look. 
For the Nazarite, it changed their hairdo. We'll get to that shortly. So here we have in, in number six, these people who could dedicate themselves to the Lord. Now, scattered throughout scripture, we have famous Nazarites. And let's walk through some of those famous Nazarites. One of the most famous that you're probably thinking of, some of you right now, and I encountered one of our covenant members this morning and they watched a movie last night on this man, a man by the name of Samson in Judges chapter 13. Now, who was Samson and what did he do? Well, we don't know his mother's name, but we know that she was the wife of Manoah, or Manoah. And she, she had a difficult time. She was barren. She couldn't have any children. And she, like Samuel's mother, Hannah, would simply tell God, God, if you would give me a child, I will dedicate this child to you. And in this dedication in Judges chapter 13 comes Samson. Now, who was Samson? We know Samson was a, a mighty judge of Israel. And after his mom said the dedication to the Lord, the Lord told him, told her, you will give birth to a son and you must never cut his hair because the boy will be a Nazarite. Samson had supernatural strength. Just, he was a man's man times 25. We know that he was so strong that he tore a lion apart with his bare hands. And you thought you were a man. Some of us are even scared of lizards. You can't even tear a lizard with your bare hands. And Samson's like ripping a lion apart with his bare hands. We know that Samson, we see in the scriptures that he collected 300 foxes, tied their tails together, put a torch between the, the, the tails of the foxes and set fields on fire as retribution. I don't even know how long it would take to catch 300 foxes. And yet Samson, he has this ungodly strength, and I would probably assume ungodly speed, supernatural speed. That was only from the strength of the Lord. We said, well, well, no one could do this other than the power of the Holy Spirit. But ultimately, Samson and his strength left him. Why? Because of his sin and because he had his head shaved. He broke his vow to the Lord. But that's not the only Nazarite we have in Scripture. You might have heard of a man named Samuel. Now, for Samson's sake, he didn't have a choice. His mom said, you're going to be a Nazarite, right? That's what the Lord said. Some of you, your parents drug you to church, but they didn't drag you to the, the Nazarite church. And Samuel was the same way. His mom, Hannah, was barren, and she, she told the Lord, if, Lord, if you would give me a child, I will dedicate him to your purposes and Samuel was the man who first anointed Israel's first king Saul Hannah said this about Samuel in 1 Samuel 1 27 she said I prayed for this boy and since the Lord gave me what I have asked for I now give the boy to the Lord but there's other possible Nazarites scattered throughout scripture we have the Rechabites and Jeremiah 35, 6, a group of descendants who would not drink wine, build a house, or plant a vineyard. That sounds like a Nazarite to me because their great-grandfather had taken a vow to the Lord and they wanted to honor that. They took their promises and they took their vows seriously. Who can forget John the Baptist? John the Baptist was a voice in the wilderness preparing the way of the Lord, preparing the way of Jesus. This says in scripture that he wore camel hair garments and a leather belt and ate locusts and wild honey. And John the Baptist was one of those that he would not be leading church growth seminars because he had people coming out in the desert to see him. And his message was, you brood of vipers. Who brought you here? That's not very inclusive. You snakes. Hey, for all you guests, stand up. You snakes. Not a, good, not a good message if you're a visitor there. Who can forget the apostle Paul who in Acts 18, 18, we see him cutting his hair after he took a vow. Some even suggest that James, the brother of Jesus Christ was a Nazarite. And we see the Nazarenes and the Nazarite vow becoming commonplace in the second temple literature, the time of Jesus Christ. 
So much so that it was often a promise that was made. And during the time of Christ, this says that the rabbis, the scribes had um, written this down to a science. So, so you could take a 30 day vow and then you would fulfill it. Um, which is not necessarily what Numbers is about. So if people are taking these vows, and maybe you're, you're thinking right now, okay, I'm in. Don't really like grapes anyway. And uh, I'm okay with the hairdo. And you know what? I, I don't really like dead things. And so I'm ready to take this vow. So if that's you, what would that look like in your life? So three things for you. Um, drink, do, and death. So let's look at those three things in scripture together. So first for the Nazarite, it's a commitment of the mouth. So verse three, he is to abstain from wine and beer, which is the best translation there. Um, oftentimes we don't have beer talked about in the Old Testament because Israel was not a beer producing nation. They were known for their vines. E Egypt was, they were known for their grains. But the best translation here is beer, that they would abstain from beer and they should not drink anything that would be similar to um, some type of fermentation from wine or beer in verse three. Um, and they cannot drink grape juice or eat fresh grapes or even raisins. And so it seems like there's a progressive commitment to abstain anything of the vineyard. And then God says to the, the Nazarite, look, in case you don't get it, don't, no seeds and no skin. Just don't touch grapes, Right? because you know how we are as humans, right? So Lord, I'm gonna commit no wine, but juice is okay, right? Okay, no juice. Okay, how about, you know, I really like grapes. How about the, the and for me, I, I've always liked the green ones over the red. I don't know why the green ones over the red ones. And so Lord, um, how about these green, the, the grapes, I, the drink I'm okay with. And, and God says, no, if you've consecrated yourself, put your whole heart into that. No grapes. So we'll say, Lord, okay, how about the dried grapes? How about raisins? And God says, no. And then someone apparently was like, well, how about the skins of the grapes? And God says, no, if you're gonna consecrate your life to me, do it fully. And so this vow would be something, a vow of the mouth. The second part of the vow was what? Not only a vow of the things that go into your mouth, but your hairdo. Look at what's said in scripture here. Verse five. You must not cut his hair throughout the time of his vow of consecration. For Samson, this was a vow of life. Do not cut your hair. He is to be holy until the time it is completed. Now, this second vow, the first vow really is more internal. How can you tell if I'm not eating grapes? But the second part of the vow is external, is it not? You can tell what my hair looks like. And, and we know in, in ancient literature and even in the New Testament and in the Old Testament too that priests were commanded not to shave their heads but they would trim their beards and the sides of their heads. So this vow to the Lord is even more strict than what the priests were commanded to do. Now I know for some of our youth I have your attention because you're thinking, man, if I take this vow, I can grow my hair out long. That's between you and your parents. So, uh, and the Lord, right? So the Nazarite vow is something you take before the Lord. So uh, you might be on board with a long hair thing. In the third part of the vow, verse six, he must not go near a dead body. Again, a restriction that is more detailed than even what the high priest was commanded to do. The, the layman who is unclean is only by direct contact. And the priest was only unclean by direct contact. But for the Nazarite, it seems like the proximity to death would cause them to break the vow. And I think when Jesus says in Matthew 8, 21, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. I think there was more going on there than meets the eye. I think there's something about the Nazarite vow. It makes more sense. I think Jesus might have been looking at someone who has taken a vow to the Lord and and this man said, well, well, Lord, let me first go back and bury my dead father. And I think Jesus was really saying, you've made a vow to God. Are you going to keep it or not? So this is the say what part of the Nazarite vow. 
But for us, what's the now what? How do we take this? How do we live out this commitment and this dedication to the Lord as we see in the word of God? Now, at the end of our service, let me just be clear. uh, We're not gonna ask anyone to make a Nazarite commitment. But I do want you to commit your life to Jesus Christ because it is the best decision you could ever make. You will never have more joy than the joy of knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You will never have the freedom until you know that Jesus Christ is the chain breaker. You will never have the assurance until you know that Jesus Christ has declared you righteous. So how do we live out? What's the now what for this Nazarite vow? So let's walk back through this scripture. Who is the vow for? We see in verse two and three, speak to the Israelites and tell them when a man or a woman makes a special vow, a Nazarite vow to consecrate himself to the Lord. So who is this vow for? Yes. Yes, it's for everyone, right? This is a vow that any person can make, whether you are male or female. And this is a vow for people who are not priests, for people who are not born into the priesthood or not born as called prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Nahum and Habakkuk or Moses, people who are not called by God in that specific capacity, but that they can make themselves holy and pleasing to the Lord. This vow was for anyone. Now, how special was the person who had to make the vow? Look at scripture again. When, what kind of man? A man. Or what kind of woman? A woman. He said, Pastor, why would we can read? Why would you mention that? When a man or a woman makes a special vow. Listen, you don't have to be a special person to make a special vow to the Lord. If you know Christ, you are a special possession, right? And so sometimes we just think, well, I'm not Moses. Who am I? God, I can't do this. And the Nazarite vow pushes us and says, no, you're a man. You're a woman and God equips you and he saves you by his, by grace alone in Christ alone. And it doesn't take a special person to make this vow. It takes a person through the power of the Holy Spirit to make a special vow. I don't know about you, but that gives me hope. It gives me hope to know that the most remarkable works throughout the scriptures and even today, the most remarkable works are through the most unremarkable people. Just someone saying, Lord, I'm in. I don't know what I have to offer, but Lord, I am in. When the Lord called Moses in Exodus 6, Moses said, God, how will Pharaoh listen to me since I'm a poor speaker? And I, I just believe God said, okay, I was hoping you would ask that. Because Moses, listen, lean in, Moses, right? For those who read Numbers, just lean in just a second. It's not about you. Like, it's not. It's not a special person, it's a special vow. So if you're anyone or everyone, this gives me hope that God can work mightily through us if we commit our full lives to God. A second take home from us is this. It's a personal vow, not a populist vow. So again, look at verse two. When a man or a woman makes a special vow, a Nazarite vow to consecrate himself. Now, okay, let's be honest. For Samuel and Saul, mama consecrated them. You don't mess with mama and her promises. But this is a personal dedication, personal vow. And and for me, I think we need to hear this in, in our culture today. Don't legislate to others what you have committed to the Lord. That's why I don't like that. How dare me, who has taken the Nazarite vow, go to Lewis and say, hey, it's a sin for you to drink grape juice. It says right here in number six. How dare 
I legislate upon you a vow that I have taken to the Lord. And if we're not careful, things that God has, now there are sins that are universal, but there are also personal commitments that you have made. Be careful not to legislate that. Those are personal, not populous. And if we're honest as a church, we just in general, we're, we're, quick to, we're quick to legislate the personal morality that God has worked in our life for. How else do we, we have the old saying that you can't drink or dance or play cards? Where does that come from? Probably someone at one point, they knew that they were in a lifestyle where dancing for them was just, it was a part of something that they shouldn't have been a part of. And, and God delivered them from that and radically saved them. And they made a personal commitment. God, I'll never do that again because it reminds me of a dark place. But if we're not careful, then we legislate that to everyone, don't we? Be careful not to legislate your personal commitment to the Lord. I, I think often what we see from the Nazarite vow is personal devotion can become divisive when we use it against others. Personal devotion can become divisive when we use it against others. Remember, it is personal, not populous. God wants humbleness, not haughtiness. That's the point of this special vow. Thirdly, what we see a take home from here, not only is it for everyone, not only is it personal, but it is, look again at verse three, verse two. When a man or a woman makes a special vow, a Nazarite vow to, to separate or to consecrate ourselves. You see, consecration is necessary when we follow Jesus Christ. Separation from the things that would bring us shame and bring us harm and bring us darkness in our life. Consecration is necessary and the Nazarite challenges us to live differently. You can't profess Christ as Lord and nothing change in your life. That would be like the Nazarite saying, God, I'll take the vow, but man, I love my hair. Let me keep it. But oh, Lord... I'll give up the green grapes, but the red ones, man, they just, nothing satisfies me. Or Lord, I'll take the vow, but you know my mom's sick. And if she were to die, Lord, you know I can't give that up. What would the Nazarites say to that? They would say, you've broken your vow and it must start all over again. And there have been situations in, out throughout scripture that happened. And shame on us when we think that we can make promises to God and nothing change in our lives. Church, where is our consecration? And I'm not saying it's about your hair. I'm not saying it's about grape juice, but it's deeper than that. We have to ask ourselves, am I willing to sacrifice temporary joys for the greatest joy I could have in Jesus Christ? Is your life a life of consecration? Am I willing to give up control? Are you willing today to say, Jesus, when I believed in my heart and confessed in my mouth that you were Lord, I effectively gave you a blank check and said, look, this is Josh and I want you to fill in what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna separate myself for the holiness and the righteousness of the one who is worthy to be praised, worthy of our adoration. Is your life separate? Now, let me say this, caveat, the Nazarite did not separate himself from society. They lived differently within the community. God is not saying to us, go find a deserted island and live for me. God is saying, live as lights in the midst of a dark generation. That's what we are called to do. Are you truly willing today to separate from sin and darkness in your life? I think another take home for us is, is this. They're to consecrate themselves to the Lord. And you say, well, man, giving up death and hair and drink, that, that's difficult, right? That, it seems like God is placing undue burdens upon the Nazarite. But if we think about it, listen, we should be reminded that the personal consecration to the Lord frees a Nazarite from not suffering the consequences of alcohol. So yes, the restrictions, yes, the abstaining in one sense is, a, is something that they put on their life, but it is freeing. 
And isn't this what we see in Jesus Christ? That consecration to the Lord brings restriction, yes, but it brings honor and freedom. What does Jesus say about his yoke? Now, what is a yoke? A yoke is a heavy burden that is placed upon um, beast of burden, most likely oxen, that directs them where they go. And they are heavy. But what does Jesus say about his yoke? He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I believe there are people here today that do not want to follow Christ because you think he just wants to steal your fun and your joy. I can't follow all those rules But what you'll find if you truly trust in Jesus Christ is that when we live a life under the control of Jesus, that there is more freedom in that than we will ever find anywhere else. I don't think the Nazarite went around saying, man, I can't cut my hair today. This is horrible. I want to fade right here. I remember when I was growing up, the rat tail was in. I never had one. Never had a rat tail. If you had, I'm not throwing stones. But maybe, this, maybe the, the Nazareth, if I could just grow my rat tail, but Lord, I can't. There's no indication that this was an undue burden. I think there was joy in saying, God, I'm gonna restrict this in my life that I might find more joy and more freedom in you. Are you willing to live a life of freedom in, under the yoke of Jesus Christ? We also see for the Nazarite and us is this commitment is to Who? And to what? Verse three again, a special vow, a Nazarite vow to consecrate himself to the Lord. It is a Christocentric vow. It is a God first commitment. Now here's what we see from the Nazarite. A changing and a commitment of the hair without a consecration of the heart is futile. If you cut your hair or don't cut your hair and your heart has not changed, you haven't done anything. That's what the Nazarite would tell us. Grow your hair out. Don't eat grapes. Don't touch dead bodies. But you know what? If you have not committed your life to the Lord, what good is this outward behavioral change? Now, that's the danger of our culture, isn't it? That's the danger of these, the church culture because we make it easy for someone to change their behavior first. No, God says, commit your life to me first and I'll change everything else. So don't be frustrated when someone hasn't changed your life if God hasn't yet changed your heart. Is your dedication to the Lord Christocentric? Is it God honoring? Are you only worried about your behavior? You see, Devotion plus duty flow from an overwhelming desire for Jesus Christ. Devotion and a heart for the Lord plus doing the things of God is a beautiful, beautiful life that is honoring to our Savior. So where do we go now from here? I'm reminded of this. They didn't read this passage of scripture, but Read through Numbers chapter six this afternoon. I just encourage you to do that. And what you will find is that the Nazarite, when they had fulfilled their vow, they had to go to the priest who would examine them and they had to offer another offering. What does that tell me? It tells me that the Nazarite vow in itself was not enough. That God never intended this Nazarite vow to, to bring salvation. You see, if you take a Nazarite vow today or take any vow to the Lord, that's not what God desires in your life. What we need is not a Nazarite, we need someone from Nazareth. That's why Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for our sins. Because even if you said for the rest of my days, I will consecrate myself in this manner to the Lord, what you will find is that even your best efforts fall short. Even the best Nazarite, ask Samson this one day when you see him. Ask Samuel this one day when you see him. Ask John the Baptist who, when he sees Christ, he he falls on his face and says, I'm not even worthy to tie the sandals of this man. Even the best efforts of you and me fall short. 
So we don't need a Nazarite vow. We need to believe in the one who was born, who is from Nazareth. His name was Jesus Christ. And he lived a sinless life. But, but Jesus, his consecration wasn't external. Like this was, it was internal. And he never sinned in his whole life. Not once. And he lived a perfect life. And the, the reward Jesus got for a perfect life was that he died on the cross. But he rose again. You say, well, Pastor, do you believe someone would live a, could live a sinless life? No, I don't believe a person could live a sinless life, but I believe God could. I believe Jesus did. Well, Pastor, do you really believe someone could rise from the dead? No, I've conducted probably hundreds of funerals at this point, never seen it happen, but I believe Jesus did. And the Bible says this, that if you would confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So how do we respond to the, this good news? Not Nazarite, but Nazareth this morning. I, I think three take-homes from this. One, the ability to be declared righteous is Christ alone. You will never be declared righteous based on keeping this vow. You're declared righteous when you put your hope and trust in Jesus Christ and Jesus says, okay, your righteous is mine. Not by anything that you have done, but is a gift of God. Righteousness is not earned. Right standing before God is not earned. It is declared. And only Jesus can do that. But the responsibility to pursue righteousness is yours. It's yours. It's mine. Sometimes we just want to sit in and say, God, you just pour righteousness into me. Lord, when, you know, I'm just going to let go and let God. You find that in the Bible and I'll preach that. It's not in there. The Bible says you are saint, you are holy ones in Christ. He has declared us righteous, but take off the old stuff. Put on the new stuff. Church, the responsibility to pursue righteousness is yours and mine. And just for me today, I'm thinking, Lord, is my life as consecrated like it should be? God, am I willing to forsake the small joys in my life that I might truly enjoy the greatest things that you have in Jesus for me? And if that's a haircut, man, I'm not gonna have another one. If that's grapes, Lord, grapes can't even compare to the beauty and the majesty of my Savior. Are you as consecrated as you should be in your life? Secondly, many have taken the vow with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and half-heartedly believe that God raised him from the dead. But that was a Nazarite vow and it was temporary and inadequate. Many of you at one point in your life have said, with your mouth, Jesus was Lord. And maybe you were baptized based on that and nothing changed in your life. And if that is you, I would just encourage you to search your heart today. Because maybe what you took, that vow of Jesus as Lord, was a Nazarite vow. You said, Lord, I'm going to do it on my own. I'm going to consecrate. It's going to be temporary. God, I'm going to nail it. But you don't have a new heart. And maybe for the first time, the Holy Spirit is working on you, and you realize you don't know Jesus like you think you do. And yet you look pretty good on the outside. But on the inside, man, you're rotten. You're sinful and you, you have not yet been declared righteous. That's you. Won't you put your trust and hope in Jesus today? There's no Nazarite vow. There's no Baptist vow that will save you. But the one who died on the cross can. Thirdly, maybe you're here and you, you're this third part and you, you've never ever trusted in Jesus. And you think it's too good to be true. It's not too good to be true. It's true. That's why it's called grace. And if you will humble yourselves and you will look into your heart and you, and you would say, God, for the first time I understand that I am a sinner. And I can never do it on my own. And if you would believe in God Believe in Christ with your heart. Not half-heartedly, but really believe and say, God, if this is true, I need this. And today I'm gonna to confess on my mouth that you are Lord. If you do that, the promise 
of God is that you'll be saved. And as I asked someone early this morning, if you and I were to die today and you looked God face to face and he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? The only thing I have is, God, you know I shouldn't be here. And you know I've sinned a lot. And God, you know my heart. But I know that you sent your son, Jesus, to give me a new heart. To take me who is dead in my sin and raise me again. And Father, on the basis that your son is everything that I need, on that basis will you accept me. And the promise that we have in scripture is that Jesus, our advocate, will come with us and say, Father, he is ours because I died for him and he believes. There is no vow that will save you, but there is a cross. And maybe this morning as we respond, you need to come to the altar and say, God, I have not been, I have not fulfilled the commitment that I made when I said that you were Lord. Maybe you need to spend some time and get right with God. Maybe you're here and you've never made that commitment and you've never made Jesus yours and he is waiting, whosoever. Today, if you need to honor and trust in Christ, we'll have counselors up front. We would love to talk to you and celebrate with you. But do not miss a chance to believe and trust in the one who loves you more than anything else. Let's pray.